Welcome to Fruity Knitting. This is episode 52. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. We have prepared another full and exciting program for you today. Our feature interview is with Emma Boyles from The Little Grey Sheep. Yes, Emma has her own sheep farm in Hampshire, the UK, and she produces wonderful yarn from her own flock of sheep. The yarn is expertly spun at John Arvin Textiles and then Emma hand paints it and hand dyes it herself. So every part of the production is really well thought out and even the way that Emma runs her sheep farm there's a strong focus on conserving the local landscape. In fact Emma's farm dates back to the Tudor times and apparently King Henry VIII himself would regularly charge through Emma's paddocks on his horse with his men and his dogs on their hunting expeditions in the early part of the 16th century. I thought that's just a a little bit of fun history trivia for you. Charging through (laughs) Emma's paddocks. Think of the mud. Outrageous. (laughs) We're going to Canada to meet Janice Hope, our guest on Knitters of the World, and we're going to take you to a 13th century castle built by Prince Llewellyn the Great in Snowdonia. We've got new releases, and our daughter Madeline is also making an appearance to show you her knitting project. But right now we're going to start with you, Andrea, with Under Construction. So I bought my first ever skein of speckled yarn at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival because I wanted to knit the Zweig sweater by Caitlin Hunter. Here's a picture of it. And it uh, asks for one skein of speckled yarn with three skeins of contrasting semi-solid colour that is going to be for the the body and the arms. So I picked my combination, colour combination, and I I wanted a low contrasting colour combination because I wanted it to be lighter and delicate and more summer-like. That was my thinking. And when I picked the skeins, they looked absolutely beautiful together. You helped me. Yeah, I was there. That was a loop. Yeah. So we thought they looked really good. Yeah. But because I'm inexperienced with speckled yarns, when it came to knitting this design in my colour combination, it was actually a disaster. Because when I wound this speckled yarn skein into a ball, it became a lot darker than what it was originally in in the skein. You can see there's even less contrast now, and there's quite a lot of long blue strands that are the exact same colour as this. So I knitted the yoke, I knitted most of the lace, but the problem was that there was too low contrast on the stranded section, so you weren't seeing the design clearly up where the triangles were. I'm going to show you a picture of my knitting so you understand what I mean. So there were lengths of blue in the speckled yarn which were the same colour as the main body yarn. So when I came to do the stranded section with the triangles there just wasn't this clear definition of the triangles and it just looked terrible, like terrible pooling. So that was my first foray into speckled yarns. I ripped it all out And as many of you know, I don't have a stash, so I couldn't just go to my stash and pick out another skein of speckled yarn that had a stronger contrast. And I'm a monogamous knitter, and I had nothing else to knit on. This sounds disastrous, darling. (laughs) I had to find a solution pretty fast. So that's where our handy yarn store that's just around the corner came in handy. And I bought this skein of yarn. It's Sandness Garn. It's Alpaca Silk Blend. I love the colour combination. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually breaking all the the rules here because... You're breaking all the wools, darling. (laughs) This is the point. This has got no wool in it. It's alpaca and silk. And this has got a lot of... Well, it's mainly merino with a little bit of cashmere and a little bit of nylon. So... Alpaca has no memory, Merino has a lot of memory, they behave very differently and that can lead to serious problems if you knit them in the same garment, which I'm doing. Right. Yeah, so, but there really wasn't anything else that I could immediately use and I just adore the colour combination, so I thought I'd just take it and, and risk it. So I'm going to show you now a picture of my new knitting. And I think it's all going to be fine because you can see where I knit the yellow yarn in the stripe at the top of the yoke. You can see that it's a finer yarn than the blue yarn, but I think I get away with it there. But lower down in the stranded knitting section where the triangles are, I've knitted with two strands of the yellow yarn because at first I knitted with a single strand, but it was too thin and the knitting looked really uneven and sloppy. 
So I decided to knit all the stranded sections holding the yarn, the yellow yarn double. So that's the triangles at the top of the lace and the bar stripes at the bottom of the lace. But I've held the yarn single on the, on the lace sec sections. And also I've held it single on the, the plain stripes of yellow. So here I am, I'm wearing my knitting. Do you like it? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of these things I can turn into working for my advantage. So I'll talk you through my thinking process. First of all, when you have small sections of stranded knitting in a yoke and, and the rest is normal knitting, usually you have to go up a needle size on your stranded knitting because the stranded part is going to be tighter and less elastic. So you just go up a needle size to, to make it the same gauge. Because I held the yellow yarn double, it makes it thicker. That automatically makes my gauge here bigger and I won't have that problem. Yeah. So I think that's worked to my advantage. Secondly, because the lace section is knitted um, in the yarn that's actually a little bit too thin, it makes it look extra delicate. Extra lacy. Yeah, which I think works. Yeah. It makes a contrast more between... More space for the holes. Yeah, but it just, this looks more delicate and that yep. looks a little bit more like a, a strong border on e either side of it. So I think aesthetically it does work. I'm talking myself into it. <laughs> Secondly, or thirdly, uh, alpaca tends to stretch and the lay section is the perfect place to put the alpaca in because it's right around the shoulders and that's where I have the most movement and that's where I would want the stretch to happen. So it could all work to my advantage. Yeah, I would have to say it's the stretch that concerns me. Because, I don't know, I don't know. We'll see how it works. I'm particularly interested in seeing how it washes up. I think it'll be fine. I'm not going to knit the, the yoke too deep, deeply. Yep. So I think I think it's going to be fine. And I totally love the colour. Yes. So I'm back to non-speckled. Yeah. Does that mean you've bailed out? <laughs> of speckled? Yeah. Well, certainly for this project. You've been burnt and yeah. out of there. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that's my project, and now our daughter's going to join us, so you have to also, go. I have to make space, all yeah. right. I'll be back. <laughs> so welcome, Madeline. This is our daughter, Madeline, for new viewers. And <laughs> you've been knitting on a new project, so tell yes. us about it. Um, my project is called Audrey and Unce. That's by Gudrun Johnston. And Gudrun Johnston was the patron of last year's Shetland Wool Week, yeah. and mum interviewed her back in episode 38. So the wool I'm using for it is called Iona wool and it's made exclusively from sheep bred on the Hebridean Isle of Iona. Mum bought it for me at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival and it's very rustic which I like a lot because um, the cardigan that I'm knitting was supposed to be a hard wearing cardigan in exactly this blue greeny shade. Yeah and mum actually bought the yarn first so then we had to look for a pattern and for that we needed the pattern to fit the gauge properly so I knitted a swatch. Yes so we had to figure out what kind of fabric would be good in this yarn and how I go about doing that is I try to aim for the kind of fabric or texture that a machine knitted garment of this kind of yarn would look like so that's always my goal in, in mind. And the reason why I do that is because because it often ends up being a little bit tighter than hand knitting, but the result is that the garment fits better. Well, it holds its shape better and it peels less and it also wears longer. So I like all of those characteristics. So we started off with 3.75 millimeter, yeah. I think. And yeah. then we went down to 3.25 millimeter to finally get exactly the, the fabric we wanted and I think this is it this is looking good yeah so what was I the final so. um, stitch gauge the final stitch gauge was 24.5 stitches per mm -hmm. 10 centimeters and mum didn't want to be making a lot of modifications <laughs> on the pattern construction and I didn't want to be reliant on mum helping me all the time so we did decide to go for a pattern that fit my gauge exactly which we ended up finding. Yeah, one yeah. that you liked. Yeah, and that suited the type of wool that this is. So I'm very happy with Audrey and Unst. 
Um, also because it's a uh, nice and I'll put this on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a nice and tight fitted garment, um, which will look nice over dresses or skirts, which is what I was really looking for in the cardigan. Yeah, so it's a fitted cardigan. Yeah. Yeah, and it is very simple. You see, there's a lot of stocking stitch involved here, but at the top of the bodice there is some elegant simple lace as well, which yeah. will make it a bit more unusual. Yeah. And I've, I've, oh yes, and of course the construction. There's a one by one um, twisted rope yes. <laughs> along the waistband um, and then you continue knitting upwards in stocking stitch all in one piece still um, up until the armholes and at the armholes you have to split it and you knit the front and the back separately. So there are also two fake seams involved here and the fake seams are really just single columns of purl stitches and around these uh, single columns you have both increases and decreases yeah. yeah which you can start seeing there you can see that you've done it very well it's very good knitting very neat and i see that you've pinched my stitch markers here yes <laughs> <laughs> mum doesn't really use hers no. so i just figured i could you're welcome to use them they do look like jewelry don't they yeah they do they look very pretty yep. i think you're doing a great job thank you Okay, so, and it is, it's quite rustic, isn't it? But you love mm -hmm. it, don't you? I love, I love rustic wool. Every wool that mum buys, I usually stick my nose in it and smell if it smells like cheap. And I feel that. Yeah. The itchier, the better. <laughs> <laughs> so we started with a one by one rib tubular cast on because we wanted it to be really stretchy. And I actually incorporated the twisted part of the rib into the tubular cast on so in case you were interested to see how I did that I've made a short tutorial that's coming up now straight after that you're going to meet Janice Hope who's our guest on Knitters of the World so Madeline thank you for your guest appearance no worry <laughs> so you're going to go off to a cafe now yes and knit yeah that's been your favorite pastime lately isn't it yes it has been <laughs> I like good coffee yeah yeah okay well, bye darling. bye <laughs> This is Madeline's knitting. She's knitting Audrey and Ernst by Gudrun Johnston and it's a cardigan knitted in one piece from the bottom up. The hem is knitted in a one by one twisted rib and we used a twisted one by one rib tubular cast on using the long tail method. There are a few different methods to do the tubular cast on and some use extra waist yarn and some don't and they all have different names ranging from Italian or German or Chinese. They all pretty much create the same result but they just do it differently so don't worry too much about the name. So basically a tubular cast on makes a strong stretchy edge where there's no cast on edge or ridge. The edge appears to have no beginning to it at all and the stitches just seem to roll over the edge to one side. This green yarn is very woolly so it's kind of hard to see it here. So here's an example of a normal tubular cast on. It's a one by one rib but it's not twisted and it's in a thicker smoother yarn and you can see that the knit stitches just carry on over the edge to the other side and it's just very rounded and, and smooth and very stretchy. The hem of this garment is knitted in a twisted one by one rib and that means that on the right side you're always knitting into the back loop of the knit stitch and purling the purl stitch normally and when working on the wrong side you purl into the back loop of the purl stitch and knit the knit stitch normally. So that means that one set of the columns are always being twisted and the alternative columns are always being worked normally. I wanted to do a tubular cast on and include the twisted part of the rib into the tubular cast on itself so that it looks that extra little bit neater and more uniform. Again, you can see this twisted rib much easier on this smoother, thicker yarn. And I've done the tubular cast on doing the twisted part of the rib right from the beginning and you can see that it's a very neat finish and that the, the twisted stitch starts right at the beginning. I started off using a much smaller needle for the setup rows than I used on the body of the rib. So I started with a three millimeter needle which is a US 3 I think and then I knitted the main part of it in a four millimeter which is a US 6. Though even though there's a big difference between those needle sizes you can see that the bottom of the columns are exactly the same width as the top so it looks really uniform and neat. 
You start with a slip knot to make the first stitch secure. The tail yarn goes over your thumb, the ball yarn goes over your fingers. Both ends can be held together with your third and fourth fingers, like this. We're going to cast on a knit stitch and then a purl stitch alternatively. A knit stitch is formed by going over your thumb yarn, up through the middle, over the finger yarn, then under both yarns and back to the beginning. And if you look closely, you can see that that looks like a knit stitch. Pearl stitches are done in the mirror. You go over your finger yarn, up through the middle, over your thumb, and then under both, back to the beginning. If you look closely at the stitch on the needle, you can see that the finger yarn is crossing over the top like a little pearl bump. So I'll do it again. The knit stitch, you go over the thumb, up through the middle, over the finger, under both yarns, and back. The pearl stitch is the opposite. You go over the finger yarn, up through the middle, over the thumb, under both, like that. You need to pinch the stitches as you go to keep them aligned with the ridge at the bottom of the needle. Nothing secures these stitches against unravelling, so don't let go of the two strands and keep the tension of both yarns even. At first the cast on stitches are just wrapped and not secure so they can swivel around and make it really hard to see which is the knit stitch and which is the purl stitch. And this can be really exaggerated if you're casting on a lot of stitches and using circular needles because the stitches are going to go down over the cord and be a lot looser. So for that reason, it can be easier to use a long straight needle just to cast on and then later change to a circular needle. We've cast on our stitches and now we need to do at least two set up rows for, for the tubular knitting. And for that, we need to knit the knit stitches and slip the purl stitches purl wise with the yarn in front. So our first stitch is a purl stitch. So we're going to slip that purl wise. Our next stitch is a knit stitch, but it looks like it's back the front. So we're going to knit into the back loop. And then yarn to the front, slip the next stitch purl wise, yarn to the back, knit into the back loop of the knit stitch. I've finished my first setup row. My second setup row, I have a look and I can see the first stitch is purl, so I'm going to slip it purl wise. And now I come to knit the next stitch. And instead of knitting it through the front loop like I would normally, I'm going to immediately knit it through the back loop and make it a twisted stitch. Yarn to the front, slip the purl stitch purl wise, and knit into the back loop of the knit stitch again. You're going to do that for at least two rows. You work an even number of this, these setup rows because each row worked is essentially only a half row knitted because you slip half the stitches on each row. So you can either do this for two rows or four rows. So after working two or four of these setup rows, you just continue knitting in the normal one by one twisted ribbing. Here it is again finished. You can see it's really neat. If you wanted to knit in the round, you would simply work your setup rows flat and then join in the round for the normal ribbing. This does leave a little gap, but you can sew that little gap up with your tail end. So I hope you're inspired to try out the one by one twisted rib tubular cast on using the long tail method. I started knitting about 10 years ago and I've been designing for most of that time as well, about eight years. Um, my knitting style is I really like to experiment. I like to try new things and see how they'll work. For example, I have this sweater here, which was published in Knitty first fall 2014. I wanted a high-low sweater, but I really don't enjoy short rows and I don't enjoy writing them either. I feel like they're awkward in a pattern. So for this sweater, there are decreases in the back, increases on the side, and that tilts the whole thing backwards. 
And then it made an interesting problem when we came to the yoke because the front is high and the back is low, but we need to fill in that space. So what I did was I continued this ribbing all the way around onto the back and then crossed it over and sewed it down. So that's the type of knitting that I like to do. So my next item to show is the Falling Leaves Blanket. This is knit out of Knit Picks Swish Bulky Yarn. It's a superwash wool, which is lovely because I get this thing dirty all the time going outside. And when I bring it back in, I just throw it in the wash, lay it out to dry, and we're all good. This thing, I was so surprised when I knit it. This was the first bulky weight blanket that I ever knit. And I found it was, it was heavy. Like it was really heavy. I didn't expect it to be heavy. And so I'd be knitting and it's heavy to lift. I'd get to the end of the row and like, you have to pick this thing up and you have to heft it around on your lap so you can go the other way. It was such a pain. I was surprised. I didn't realize, but I am so glad I made it. It's a quick knit though for all the pain. And it's a beautiful blanket. This is my crown tee, which is knit with Malabrigo's lace yarn, which is a lovely single ply lace weight yarn. It's very soft. The whole concept of this sweater when I made it was to make a simple tee that had invisible shaping. So while the body has shaping, it takes place in horizontal rows, so you can't really see it, but it fits beautifully. It nips you right in. And then same with the yoke, all the shaping is in the lace pattern. And there's some knots here that you can see just small details that make it really pretty. Besides the shaping being invisible, I also wanted the edges to be relatively invisible. So it's folded hems that are stitched in, as well as the sleeve and the neck as well, which just makes for a really nice, clean finish. This is one of my favorites and one of the first sweaters that I made as well. This is my January pullover, which was released a couple of years back. It's knit in Space Cadet Oriana which this particular colorway was one that I specially requested from Stephanie and she made for me. I wanted a beautiful rusty red. One of the reasons that I really love to wear this sweater in particular is that my now husband accompanied me on the photo shoot and he kind of hung out in the background and we were taking pictures. And afterwards, actually once we were engaged, I asked him what he had thought. And what he told me was that not only had he like he thought I looked unusually beautiful that day, but also the fact that I had made the sweater and the sweater was beautiful. It all just, he said it was just overwhelmingly beautiful. Just the whole picture of me wearing my own sweater. So I particularly like to wear it for that memory. Besides that, I also like this sweater because it's the first time I use bust shaping. Bust shaping gives you extra length in the front to cover your bust and so the hem lays flat. The sides lay flat, it just fits nicely. This is quite a densely knit sweater, so you would really see wrinkles. If I turn it over, you can see the back hem is riding a little bit higher. That's that extra length from the bust shaping. But yeah, it was a fun knit. It's perfectly finished with nice bound necklines, and it fits me like a glove. I love it. This is my jewel lace pullover, which is a newer design of mine which is knit in KPC Yarns Cashmere 4-ply, which is a lovely, very soft and very dense cashmere. I've never seen any other yarn quite like it, but it makes for a wonderful knit. This one is like the Crown Tee in that it has the yoke pattern, a seamless yoke, circular yoke, and all the shaping happens within the lace, and there's cables in here as well, which is quite fun. This one was an interesting experiment because I made the body a different shape. I made it quite flared which was an experiment. I don't own any sweaters quite like this and I've never knit any, but here you can see it. I was really impressed. I like it better actually than the straight body version. So I was really pleased and it's cashmere. So it's the one I want to wear anyways. It's been flattering. A lot of people have knit it and they found it really flattering as well and, and really enjoyable to wear just because of the way it swings and swooshes too. This is my Persian Dreams Throw, which I knit quite a few years back. I actually didn't knit it all. My sister helped do a lot of the knitting for it. It's knit in Knit Picks Palais Yarn, which is a lovely fingering weight yarn that felt slightly and comes in millions of colors. It's like, it's the best. I love choosing my palette colors. This one, I wasn't sure. This was my first 
big color work project. The first one that I made that had more than two or three colors. So knowing that I didn't really know what I was doing, what I did was I chose the easy route and I said, I'll make a white background. I'll take bright colors. What can go wrong? It has to turn out right. And it did. It turned out quite well. The thing you have to know though, before you make your own Persian dreams is that it does not look good at the start ever. You start off in the center of each of these hexagons. You start knitting in the round and it looks bad. It looks really bad. Like it's this sloppy cast on, there's yarns everywhere. You start color work right away before it looks nice and flat. It just looks like a mess. You make each hexagon. They don't look the same by themselves. They don't look as balanced or as beautiful, just one hexagon. And then as you're sewing it together, like all the edges that are not sewn are curling. They look weird. The thing looks weird. It looks horrible. The whole time I made it, I would spread it out and I'd keep adding them. And it like, it honestly, it started to look worse before it started to look better. And it wasn't until I sewed the last hexagon in, I woven the last ends, I blocked the whole thing. And then was like, whoa, where'd this come from? Like this thing used to be hideous. How did it become beautiful? So just always keep that in mind. There's lots and lots of projects in life where you make it at the start, it looks bad, and then it just transforms. Janice's husband, or I think it was her fiance at the time, uh, being overwhelmed with Janice wearing her beautiful handmade sweater. Well, she's a pretty gorgeous girl, so you can imagine the scene. Yeah, it's very yeah. cute. I, I, he was he was obviously a goner at that stage. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I found it interesting that she's been knitting for ten years, and she's already been designing for eight years. So she moved into designing really quickly. Yeah, but if you read on her blog, she actually writes that she was studying uh, sewing pattern drafting. So I just imagine that okay. as soon as she learned to knit, she just transferred all of her skills Made over. Made a transition there, yeah. yeah. Okay, and she has a really wide range of garments and designs there. I know she, she showed us her blanket pattern there, the Persian blanket. Um, I love the fact that she's really open about the fact that it only looks good once you've finished. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I can understand that. I did yeah. see on Ravelry she has got some other blanket designs which are also really stunning, different, and I really appreciate the fact that her top designs, her you know, her tops are all really individual designs. They are yeah. all very unique I, constructions I and, and the look of very, them. Very, very yeah. creative. So Janice is offering a discount uh, on all of her patterns to our patrons. So that's a 25% discount on all of her patterns for Fruity Knitting patrons. And all of Janice's garment patterns have six sizes. So covering extra small, that's a 28 to 32 inch bust, to uh, XX, which is a 48 to 52 inch bust. And Janice writes that when she sizes her patterns up, she pays particular attention to the fit in the larger sizes. So, for example, most of her yokes have different shaping for each size to give a more tailored fit on the upper end sizes. So that's really great. If you've got a more voluptuous figure and you're looking for some really well-fitting garments in the upper end sizes, you might want to give Janice a try. Yep. I haven't actually knitted any of her patterns, but... I think she strikes me as someone who knits or, or pays a lot of attention to detail. Yeah, I think she's very professional about that, so yeah. that's good. So now we're up to you. Yeah, so we're going to go on to go back to under construction. We're going to be looking at my vest. Yep, so just before we start on my vest, Andrea, I wanted to ask you, you have actually said a couple of times that you don't like knitting a garment twice. That's correct. Yeah? But I have noticed, right, just looking at your twig, where you're actually you're kind of knitting it for the second time now. And I thought back to your Samfree, which you very much knitted twice. 
And and then I thought of your blossoms where I think you knitted it twice or even three times, all the intarsia and colour work here. What I seem to see is that you generally do actually knit your garments twice. You just only end up with one garment <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> You're being very cheeky. Yeah, all right. Anyway, we might get back to that in a minute. Um, so this is my vest. This is where it is right now. It's really good knitting, stunning work there, isn't it, Dals? Yeah. Looks, looks, you know, sort of right. A few people did comment after the last episode. We didn't talk about my vest in that episode because it was full. But um, some people said, oh, you're not making much progress. And, well, I mean, looking at that, that's, that's kind of true, given that that's another two weeks. But the thing is, there's that. But there's also this. And this is what I started working on. And this is actually knitted right up to where the sleeves should start happening. And um, Dals, but I've, I've stopped working on this. Why, why are we stopping working on that? <laughs> Rhetorical question. Yeah, right. Just, uh, we're, I'm actually stopping working on this because it's too small for me. Right. Once we got up to this point, we did just kind of wrap okay, it around me. But we, we should tell new viewers, I'm designing Andrew a vest, which he's That's knitting. That's right. So I'm so designing it's my it. my design. I'm knitting it according to your design that actually... And you're knitting it too tight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, apparently I'm knitting it too tight, but the problem is the number of stitches along yes, here. Yes, yes. Okay, I concede. Yeah. I have made a design mistake with my maths and it's just was a little bit too tight for him. So he knitted all of this very beautiful That's work. Such good work. And then I said to him, look, it's a little bit too tight on you. The best thing to do is to rip it all out and we'll start again. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm thinking I might use it as a vest for Jack. I'm going to modify it. Because if we start again, it's going to fit you beautifully and you'll wear it all the time. Yeah, I certainly do want something that I can wear. But I was just wondering, you know, having observed that you also generally knit things twice to yeah. end up with one garment, I just wondered if this is sort of a rite of passage that you're putting me through. <laughs> is this, you know, the apprentice like the master or something like that? <laughs> something I have to go through. Well, look, I do concede. It's, I'm terribly sorry. It is awful for you, but you are doing well and you're doing I'm second doing time so well. better. You're actually going a little bit too loose. So don't get too loose oh, or it might the, be a third thing, time. But let me just, let me just say um, it is totally my mistake. I did make a mathematical error. But it is also your mistake because you yeah. have taken a class with Kate Athley on tech editing yeah, and, and you didn't tech edit my passion. No, I didn't tech edit. No, my mistake was that I trusted you, darling. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I've learned that. Um, yeah. So that's that. Um, the, the other thing that I notice as I'm knitting this is it seems to be taking even longer than the first piece. And that's because it's wider and you've got more stitches. More stitches. Yeah. All right. Well, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, that's my vest. It's coming along. I'm not sure what what year. It's slow it living. Will be finished. It's a story of slow living, persistence, and forgiveness. Forgiveness. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm not up to the forgiveness yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going back in time now to our Christmas holiday in Snowdonia, where we're going to take you to Dolbadan Castle, which was built by Prince Llewellyn the Great in the 13th century. Some of you have seen that we've got some drone footage in our show. The drone was actually a Christmas present from Andrea. Yes. And it did make Christmas it on the trip. Christmas and birthday. Christmas and birthday present. <laughs> Um, and it did come with us on our trip to Snowdonia. We did manage to have some fun, but we didn't get a whole lot of practice. You can't fly a drone in the rain. And so we didn't get a whole lot of chances to fly it in the Welsh winter. Yeah. But here it comes. Um, so enjoy it and enjoy our extreme knitting. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Naila Plasky, and I have been invited here today to talk about my latest knitting pattern called Big Stitch Beanie. I also like to call it a knitter's hat. My daughter Alina has graciously agreed to model a child size copy of this pattern, and I think she's doing a great job. Big Stitch Beanie is a bottom-up knitted hat with overall colorwork pattern that goes through to the increases of the hat with an optional pom-pom. I decided to make a hat because colorwork design has always fascinated me. I think of it as drawing with stitches. So one day I decided to draw loops of stockinette fabric onto graph paper and the rest is history, by which I mean I swatched and did the math and knitted the hat and tested the pattern and now here we are. It was my first time knitting with Shetland wool and I used Jamison and Smith two-ply jumper wool which is an excellent yarn for this pattern. It comes in a huge range of beautiful colors, it's very inexpensive and you need just about two balls of this yarn for the hat and there's enough left over to make a pom-pom. Big Stitch Beanie Pattern is geared toward advanced beginner to <coughs> intermediate knitters and uh, the pattern includes two sizes, child and adult. It also has a couple of general tips on working colorwork patterns such as holding your dominant color yarn to the left from your background color yarn and more. I am very happy with the way my Big Stitch Beanie pattern turned out. It's exactly how I imagined it. And I think there will be a Garter Stitch pattern coming soon. I hope that my work inspires you to pick up a color work pattern to work on. And if it will be a Big Stitch Beanie, that would make me very happy. <laughs>I think Nalia's daughter just stole the whole show. <laughs> she was, she a was star. so cute. You can see she was being a really good girl. She was standing still. She was looking at the camera. She was smiling and waving on cue. Yep. It was really super cute. Yep. So I think the Big Stitch Beanie is a great pattern, first pattern if you haven't done stranded knitting before, you might want to give it a try. And I've just finished using the Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight, which is the recommended yarn. And I can also say that it's perfect for stranded knitting and it's very yeah. affordable. So that's great. And Nalia has offered our patrons a 30% discount on this pattern for a limited time. So if you have been on the fence about trying stranded knitting, this could actually be the pattern for you. And if you're into matchy-matchy, you could knit your child or your grandchild a matching hat. That would just be adorable. Yeah, I'm keen on the matchy-matchy concept. If you do that, get it up on the Ravelry group. So thanks, Nalia, for your contribution. It's a great hat. That was really cute, yes. Yeah. Every episode, we ask our viewers to support us by becoming a patron, if they can afford it and if they value the work that we're doing. And we do this because we're independent and we really need to grow our patron support. We put a huge effort into planning, producing and polishing every part of the program because we really want you to feel inspired, we want you to learn something and really enjoy watching the show. So if you value the work that we're putting in, please contribute by becoming a patron. And if you're already a patron, thank you very, very much. <laughs> That's right. We're now up to our interview with Emma Boyles of The Little Grey Sheep. Emma has wonderful yarns. Some of you may have met her at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival recently. We did this interview with Emma in person when we visited her at her farm during our Christmas holiday last year. It's a really interesting interview, so enjoy it. Thank you very much for being with us today. There's a little bit of drone footage in it. There it was is, our first flight. It's our second flight because the camera wasn't turned on for the first That's flight. Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for being with us. We'll see you in two weeks. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. I'm sitting here with Emma Boyles at Well Manor Farm in Hampshire, the UK. Thank you so much for inviting us to your farm and joining us on the podcast, Emma. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so Emma is a sheep farmer who produces a range of yarns and spinning fleece under the label The Little Grey Sheep. And you can buy her yarns online, but you can also see Emma and her yarns at the major yarn festivals. And I first met Emma at, earlier this year at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. And more recently, she's been at the Danish Yarn Festival, Fano, and you've be, also been to Hamburg. Uh, we went to Hamburg last year, and also we went to Vienna okay. in April this year, which yeah. was lovely. Yeah. So this is an example of her yarn. This is the Hampshire four-ply in this design that I'm wearing. And we will talk more about her yarn later. But first of all, I want to talk about Well Manor Farm because Well Manor Farm dates back to the Tudor times. And that's roughly 500 years. So that is an amazing heritage for you to be part of. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it, we've actually found some silver Roman coins as well on the farm. So it could even date back further. Yeah. But the um, actual farmhouse dates back to Tudor times, which, as you say, is quite... Incredible. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. So... Um, in, the, in 2004, you and your husband, Neil, bought Well Manor Farm and you had the intention to farm in a traditional manner, uh, which included having sheep for grazing purposes or yeah. conservation grazing purposes. Yeah. So I thought we'll start right there because what does uh, traditional farming actually mean? Talk about that for a bit and why it, it preserves the countryside. And then tell us a little bit about the running of your farm and the basic products that you're producing. Okay, so going back to Tudor times, um, a farm would have traditionally had um, some crop, some animals, and they would have rotated around the farm so that the animals would have manured where the crop was going to grow, um, and it wasn't very intensive. Obviously, since um, the war, you know, intensive farming has meant that most farms <clears throat> have gone over to crops, which is arable, and a lot of our livestock has left the fields. Um, the trouble is with that is, if, um, to put it basically, if you don't have animals in the field, you don't have poo in the field. Yeah. And if you don't have poo, you don't have the beetles. And then we've actually lost probably about 70% of our farmland birds since the early 80s. So that's quite a dramatic yeah. Um, yeah. decline. So our whole thing of buying the farm was actually to be able to put back and get the farm working as it would have um, in years gone by um, with getting sheep back on for conservation grazing and really not to intensively grow crop. Yeah, yeah. And so you've got Gotland sheep and now it's it's the largest <laughs> flock in the UK, isn't it? Yeah. So we started off with seven and um, never really quite realised um, how it was going to go. But yes, we've got the, the largest uh, Gotland yeah. flock in the UK yeah. um, and they're a rare breed in the UK so it's it's quite a, a quite an achievement, really. Yeah. So you and your husband, you didn't come from farming families yourself, but you grew up in the country. So was that a strong learning curve for you to to get in there and, <laughs> and start learning? Yeah, I think it's um, that that old saying: you don't know what you don't know. So Neil's a, a city boy. I grew up in the country. But the learning curve has been exponential on looking after the land, um, looking after the livestock, um, making it all work. Um, and it would be nice to say that we haven't um, made any mistakes, but actually that's where you learn most yeah, from, yeah. Um, especially with the livestock. Um, it's, a slow, it's a slow process, but uh, I probably if, if we'd looked at the beginning at what we needed to learn, we would have never taken the farm on. Yeah. Um, but now looking back, um, it's uh, it's a really um, sort of satisfying major, a, yeah. achievement yeah. that the, that we've uh, got a, a, a farm that's working really well. Yeah, and the building was derelict too, wasn't it? The the house um, wasn't quite derelict, okay. but um, it was being lived in, but it was falling down. Yeah. So we had to work on the farmhouse and all the farm buildings um, had been really left to rack and ruin. It had been a dairy farm and then had gone out dairying to grow crops full time. And therefore, the, the buildings weren't, in, weren't being used or maintained. So really, it wasn't just looking after the house that was derelict. A lot of the land had been left unmanaged. A lot of the woodland left unmanaged and all the buildings. We always have a very big to-do list. <laughs> 
I could imagine. So um, you're producing yarn. You've also got skins and spinning fleece. They're the, yeah. the major things that you're yeah. producing now. Yeah. I think that was one of the attractions of the Gotland flock is that um, they do have these three products. The fur skins are sought after, um, amazing lustrous fleece, which the hand spinners love, and also it makes a fabulous yarn. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it really made sense for a small farm like ours to actually, everything has to really pull its weight yeah. to, to make sense of um, keeping it. Yeah. Okay. And we have to talk about Susie the shepherdess because Emma has a female shepherdess working for her who plays a major role in managing mm. the flock. And she also does the shearing and she shears the flock in winter, which is unusual. So you mm. have to tell us why shearing mm. in winter is a good thing. And what are some of the other things that she's doing on a day-to-day -day basis with the sheep to ensure that they're really good quality fleeces? Mm. Or uh, Susie um, has been... Um, uh, shepherding uh, since she was about 12 she started her own flock then and shearing shortly after she has traveled the world shearing and also competes regularly um, at shearing competitions so she's been absolutely fantastic and I've learned everything I know about the sheep management from from Susie's experience um, we shear in the winter which is quite unusual um, although it's not unusual in Sweden because yeah. to bring them in, yeah. bring the sheep in, um, you generally shear them before they're in the barn. Otherwise they get hot and sweaty and rubbing up against each other, it destroys the fleece. So what we we are doing is we're almost following the, the Swedish yeah. system. Yep. But by shearing um, in the depths of winter, the fleece has got all its oils and it's doing the maximum possible to keep that sheep warm um, in the quality of the fleece. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, we share in the summer where the fleece has um, cut off its goodness to the old fleece because it's expecting that to be discarded by the sheep and then the new fleece is growing. So we take the fleece at its premium. Um, don't worry, we don't, <laughs> we don't put the girls back out in the cold. They all come into the barn, which they're absolutely thrilled about, yeah. into deep straw that we've made earlier on in the summer. This has two benefits. One, um, obviously, we get the premium fleece from our girls, but also it gets all the sheep off our land. Mm. And where we are in Hampshire, we're on clay caps. So we have clay and chalk and sand, but most of the clay sits on the top of the land. And if we were to leave the animals out over winter, then they would their little feet poach, which means that they push all the grass into the mud and destroy the structure of the pastures. So by taking all the sheep in and shearing them all at that time of year, it gives all our fields a really, really good rest. The ground can rest. The girls are warm in their barn. Mm. We can keep a really good eye on them, especially the mums to be, yeah. and make sure that they're being fed well and keep an eye on the, tw um, the mums that are going to have twins. So it's sort of a win-win. It works really well for our farm and it works really well for our yarn. Yeah. And Susie also manages all the breeding, doesn't she? So I, I yes. assume she's looking around for, yeah, for rams and things, for tups. Yes. <laughs> so uh, Susie keeps um, uh, sort of records on all our, our breeding. So we have the Stein Fine Wolf fl um, flock and we have a Gotland flock. And it's really important that obviously all the ram lines and all the family lines are kept separate because um, we don't want any interbreeding, yeah. which could then cause obviously problems with the health of our, our lambs. Um, being a rare breed, it's not always easy to get new bloodlines, yeah. but we do have quite a lot of bloodlines and we um, had some new Swedish bloodlines this year. Um, so we're able to keep the uh, families' lines separate, which is obviously really important. Yeah. Um, Susie also, because she shears, which I think this is probably our sort of um, our golden ticket, is because she shears, as we're shearing, she's monitoring the fineness of the, the fleece. Yeah. Monitoring it, so then she can take the number of that animal. And its pedigree. And its pedigree. Yeah. And then we know when we come to the next year which animals that we're going to 
use and breed. Yes. Yeah. That's very interesting, isn't it? it? And and also you were telling me before that she's really gentle with the sheep. The way she shears, yes. you can take time and do it properly. So, mm. so, so a lot of um, farms with our number of sheep, so we have about 550 sheep, um, would get us maybe a team in to shear because it's really quick. We do it in small lots, so we bring in 30 sheep at a time. There's a couple of reasons for this, that um, we don't want them to get bored and lie down in, uh, in, their in, muck. in the muck, <laughs> um, which would obviously <laughs> impact on their fleas. Yeah. And then as Susie will shear them, she takes her time. It's really important for us when we're shearing that we don't get what we call double cuts. So if yeah. you're rushing on and um, with the shearing, it's very easy to leave maybe um, a centimetre or centimetre and a half of fleece and then you would come back across that again. Yeah. And then you've got this little bit of fleece, which really isn't It's no good yeah. for us for the um, spinning. The other thing is that because we have a lot of merino blood in our Steinfein wool flock, as you will well know, mm. that they are very wrinkly. <laughs> they are. And if you rush... Then you can uh, cut easier. Then you can yeah. cut, and we're very, very careful. So Susie don't, obviously does our sheep, um, but she sort of specialises in small flocks. She does a lot of show sheep where it's really, really important about the quality mm. of the shearing. Um, and I think she really enjoys it as well because a lot of the time we're shearing for the well-being of the sheep, but not because the fleece means anything. Mm. Um, historically, obviously, the price of fleece mm. has gone um, sort of rock bottom. Yeah, yeah. So then it just becomes um, a welfare issue to get that fleece away yeah. so that they don't um, get affected by fly strike. So for Susie to be shearing where actually it's really, really important, it, it makes gives, her job more meaningful. Yeah, it gives yeah. her a lot more value, feeling a lot more sort of value of her, her job. And her skills, yeah. And we actually shear twice a year. So we shear before Christmas for our, our prime crop. And then Susie will do um, a top-up shear sort of at the end of May, beginning of June, um, because they do get a little bit tufty. And then they, we've got a really clean base for our new fleece to come up through. Great. So she, she's kept busy. So, Emma, let's have a look at your ranges. You've got three ranges. You've That's got right. the British Scotland, the Stein Fine Wool and the British Hampshire. And they've each got a really interesting story behind how they developed. So you have to tell us the story. But start off with what you started out with right at the beginning, the first range. Okay. So we started off with the Gotland sheep. And for those of you who haven't seen Gotland fleece before, it's quite unusual. It's almost akin to a hare. And in, in Sweden, they sort of um, breed it more for a, a hare. So it's um, very drapey. It hasn't got a lot of memory, um, mm. but it's very, very lustrous. And the Gotlands come in um, a range of colours from sort of almost a pewter black, yeah. just off black, um, charcoal right through to a silvery colour. So when we were looking to um, make a Gotland yarn, um, we wanted it to be light enough to dye on. Mm -hmm. So this is our base color for the Gotland yarn. It's beautiful, yeah. And you can see that it's quite, um, some people would call it lank, but it's quite drapey. So it's quite long and lean and doesn't have much much spring. So, but it's also phenomenally warm. Mm -hmm. And the Gotland fiber is, about six to eight inches long. So we worsted spin mm -hmm. the Gotland um, because if we wanted to wool and spin it, we would have to cut it yeah. because you can only um, use fibers of under sort of two and a half inches okay. for a wool and spun. And then we kept the dark fibers um, and collected those and we actually developed our own, what we call the dark side. It's not after Star Wars. It's <laughs> so we're looking at the seven sins it's on this. So beautiful, yeah. So this is all our dark fibres mm -hmm. that go into our our, Got, our Gotland um, dark side, mm -hmm. and we do dye onto the dark side, and that gets some really deep, rich colours. Rich, rich colours. But it's a, obviously a very limited palette because you're using such a a dark base. Base, yeah. 
We then um, looked at um, doing some crossbreeding and we actually used our Gotlands onto some um, Shetlands that um, Susie bought. And we came up with the start of our Steinfein wool. And um, the Steinfein wool has developed over the, the um, years and we imported two superfine merino rams. And we now have a really, really super fine, crimpy, yeah. crimpy fiber. So that's it before it's washed. But then, yeah. so we, you can sort of see the fineness in the fiber. What's special about this is we didn't really want to go totally down the merino route because the merino is actually quite a matte fiber. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to get all the lovely luster from Gotland yeah, yeah. Into, into the yarn, but with that softness. And so this is one of our, oops, sticking there, one of our Stein fine wool colors. And you can sort of see the difference here. You know, both of these are the same weight. They're both four ply. They're both 100 grams. Yeah, but that's they're loftier, same, isn't yeah, it? And they're same drapier. meterage, but, you know, and I would say they're both as soft as each other, they but are, one is yeah. maybe a more traditional softness than yeah. the um, Gotland. And both of those are worsted. And because you have this problem, all our, all our worsted yarn, we have to make sure that when we're sorting the fiber, which we do every single fleece is sorted on the farm, that every piece of fiber is over three inches long because otherwise we're paying for it to be washed, paying for it to be produced to just fall through the gaps. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what we started doing is keeping um, the shorter fleeces to one side, not really knowing what we were going to do with them yeah um and then we came up with an idea of doing a blend and doing making a woolen blend with our shorter fibers and that turned into Hampshire the Hampshire <laughs> <laughs> so this is um I just I I do well I'm really sort of biased but I love all our yarns this is a, a great yarn it's really resilient to pilling which is it really is I can totally say that from experience <laughs> Just, I'll interrupt here, but this ju jumper, which I love this design, it's very lacy, but I wear it hiking. <laughs> I could almost wear it to bed <laughs> and it still looks as good in the yes. morning. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. And that is, um, you know, testament to the, the spinning, but it's, it's just a really good um, woolen yarn. Yeah. Um, and it's really nice to have um, a different, different yarns because they, they have different characters and we can, um, you know, you can really sort of make the best of every pattern that yeah. comes along, dependent on whether you want a, you know... Um, a, a sock, a, a yeah. fine jumper, or something you want to wear yeah. every day. Absolutely. And even the yeah. same pattern with a different yarn has a totally different feel. Yeah, yeah. So right next to you, we've got a jumper, um, and that is the, what is that? Is this it, is Gotland Four Ply. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is the Magpie Cardigan by Marie Wallen. Okay, so that's in colour work, and that's looking lovely, isn't it? Yes. Uh, it's A lot of people feel that they can't use um, Gotland for colour work because it's not going to pop enough, yeah. but actually here you can see that you get a really soft, muted um, fabric, yeah. Um, and the the nice thing with the Gotland is that it does bloom slightly, which softens um, the colour. Yeah. But it doesn't take away from the colour. Yeah. So it depends on if you like that um, the ferrule patterning that's not so traditional, where the colours are very clear and bright. Yes. Then that's totally perfect for it, and it looks beautiful in that design, doesn't it? Yes. And it is really, really warm, so it's it's a really good mm. good winter fabric. So they're all coming in four ply and DK weight, and you've got some lace weight as well. Yeah, we're just waiting for our new um, Gotland lace weight um, to come back. It's um, we sell out every year, so I suppose that's good, but it's also bad sometimes. Um, so we're really excited about getting on our our new season's um, lace weight back, and that's a, a five hundred meter. Uh, for 100 grams and that's really really popular yeah um with with uh, the british and knitters more for um shawls and actually a lot of my scandinavian customers like it for actually knitting on a two mil to get a, 
um, a really nice tight okay. fabric. Yeah. Yes, because in Scandinavia, very small fine yarns are very popular. Yes. Aren't they? Yeah, it's amazing. That's great. And you've also got a sock yarn, haven't you? So we've got a, a sock yarn which we decided to put 10% um, um, nylon in. Although our yarns are all worsted, so they're really strong, I think a lot of people, when they're going to the effort of making socks, just want a little bit more um, reliability in the wear. Mm. Um, and that's been really popular as well. So that's something new that we've done this year and that we're going to continue to do. We'll talk about the dyeing now because you send your wool away to be washed and prepared and spun and you could also have it dyed but yeah. you've chosen to do all of the dyeing yourself here at the farm and that actually surprised me because I would have thought running a farm you would already be working really long hours. So you have to tell us why did you get into hand dyeing yourself and then talk a little bit about what kinds of or types of hand dyeing that you're mm -hmm. doing. So the first time that we actually sent the yarn away, we only had 100 skeins back to dye. So it was obviously um, the only way to do it was to dye it myself. Yeah. And then each year we've grown and grown yeah. and grown. Um, but there's three ways that you can dye. Um, you can either dye in the hank, um, like this, or you can dye, um, the cone can get dyed, and that's called packet dyeing. Okay. Or a lot of people will have um, their fleece dyed, so dyed in the fluff, and then it's almost like using the fleece to blend and maybe create a, um, a tweedy look, for yeah. example, with yeah. different, uh, different uh, color mixes, or then it will be processed and spun in the color. What you tend to find, <clears throat> and all the um, sort of experts I've spoken to about packet dyeing, um, is that because the pressure that the cone is under, because obviously it's all on a cone and it has to be forced through, for a fine yarn, it will crush the, the yarn. Okay. So for us, where we've got um, a knitting yarn, we've spent all this time preparing it, looking after the sheep. The last thing we want to do is right at the last minute is spoil it. <clears throat> With the dyeing in the fluff, you obviously get a really nice finish, but it is maybe more for a commercial Come, um, sort of yarn yeah, where yeah. they're producing a huge amount of yarn so really then it comes back down to hank dyeing and there's only one small hank dyer in the UK and everybody wants to use him so okay. <laughs> that's why yeah. we ended up deciding to just keep it at home yeah. and it gives me so much more flexibility um, and with the colours is um, to be honest that's my favourite part is actually you know, working with the colours and okay. it's like alchemy, yeah. really. So it looks like you've done hand painting here and you've got semi-solids. Is that...? So very much when we're um, when I'm dyeing is that I'm not trying to saturate the yarn. Um, you know, there's some beautiful yarn, commercial yarns out there, but that's obviously not where we're at. We're trying to let the yarn speak through the colour. Mm -hmm. um, so here we can see that um, the variation of the Gotland coming through um, and I think it gives a, a really nice depth. Mm. Um, yeah. This one, so that is on a, oh, that is on the pale grey base and then this, this one, which um, is one of my favourites, is onto the um, on the dark on the dark side base. Okay, yeah. So you can see that it it's a much darker tone. So we can get some really quite vivid colors with the pale gray base, yeah. but on the dark side, you know, you get these almost jewel-like colors, yeah. um, but we only do about six or seven colors in the dark side. That's beautiful, yeah. Okay. So that it, those semi-solids um, sort of dying there, but then this is what we um, have become known beautiful for. Beautiful together. <laughs> yeah, is our painted yarns. Um, I prefer to paint the yarns rather than dip dye because um, it gives them a softer transition between the colors um, and the blending. Um, it does take a lot longer to do. Yeah. And um, it's a little bit trickier when you're dyeing in bigger lots to get a consistency that somebody could maybe buy 10 skeins for a jersey. Yeah. But I think you could probably agree it's, you get it's a stunning. fantastic. Yeah. Um, finish on it's totally the totally beautiful wow Great. and this is the same on the hand painted on but on the stein sock so you can see that again it's just much 
much more vivid. Yeah. Um, but again, there's lovely soft transition between the colours. Um, I, th I, yeah, I think, I think it works really, really well. Yeah, great. Okay, so we nearly finished the interview, but I just want to have one last question. And I want to go back to talking about um, how, what you've done with crossbreeding, because mm. I find this a really interesting topic. Because uh, many sheep farmers are really passionate about keeping the purity of their breeds, and they say that it takes many, many generations to have a superior flock and that the breeding knowledge is all handed down through the generations. Mm. And I first of all learnt about this in James Rebank's book, A Shepherd's Life, and I've just finished reading both of uh, Amanda Owen's books. She's a shepherdess in the Yorkshire Dales, and her husband, she says, can stare for hours on end at his flock looking for good breeding characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> and earlier, um, this is how my interest in this subject has grown, earlier we did... Uh, an interview with the Dennis family in Australia and they're six generation farmers and they bred the original Polworth sheep and that is now considered to be a top class spinning fleece and it's bred and the Polworth sheep breed is bred all around the world but it took them 40 years to, bre to actually breed this breed. Mm. So my question mm. is what are some of the really important things that you've learned through experimenting with crossbreeding, because you've taken the Gotland and mixed it with the Shetland and a few genes mm -hmm. of Merino in? Yeah. Um, yes, and you've done all of this to be continually trying to develop the quality of your fleece and therefore the quality of yeah. your yarn. So what are some of the important things you've learned? I think um, because we are farming for fine fibre, our whole emphasis is on breeding for the fleece. Um, whereas where we, as a country, we've gone over to meat production for sheep and, and nobody's worried yeah. about the fleece, then yeah. the sort of the good genes have been lost. It It is um, a long process. It takes, um, when the rams go in, it takes five months for the lamb to be born. Then we don't, so that be in March, we don't um, shear until Christmas, but that's still lamb's fleece. Mm -hmm. That lamb's fleece then goes off to be produced. We might not get that back for a year. Um, and it's only the following year that it will be an adult fleece that you'll really know the How full well quality. It was. Yeah. So it's a long process. You have to be looking all the time, which is where the Susie being involved in the shearing, noting down the quality of the fleece as we shear. The other thing is that you have a very short space of time to decide on your rams that you're breeding, because we normally castrate our rams mm -hmm. um, at a couple of days old, mm -hmm. three days old. Uh, we don't want lots of boys running around. It no. causes lots of problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you need to be pretty sure what you're doing because yeah. you don't want to suddenly find that you've got a fabulous fleece sheep, yeah. um, but he's he's not able to work anymore. Yeah. So. All, all this comes, a lot of it comes down to Susie's experience with yeah. shepherding and a constant discussion. So as she's sharing, I'm sorting, we're talking together, we're looking at the fleeces, we stop, we assess things, we write notes, um, and it's a constant, a constant process. So it's basically you're always looking at planning two years ahead or so. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also... An, Years ago, I worked in telecoms and it was quite a new thing then, but continual improvement. And I think it's, I never realised, but it does stick with you. It's never just accepting. It's always looking to try and do something better yeah. um, and looking after the animals better, the husbandry better, gives a better fleece, better breeding. Mm. It just keeps coming. And I think that does come through in our yarn that yeah. you know you get a really high quality product and it's also a mixture of a lot of high skills you've got Susie the shepherdess you've got you and your knitting and customer base mm -hmm. understanding you've also got um, the spinner who's spinning yeah. it's very much um, a team teamwork and when you actually put it all together of all the years of experience it's quite scary to get one skinny yarn but obviously Susie's management you know the two-year process from um, tupping to uh, or putting the rams into getting the the yarn back um, the spinner John um, spin John Arban spins most of our our yarn 
Um, you know, he's got years and years. He's a really skilled artisan mm. spinner. Yeah. And most of our um, yarns are spun on his smaller machines because they are tricky to spin because they're so lustrous, they want to pull apart. Mm -hmm. um, and you, if you overspin, it comes like wire. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a real team, you know, right from Susie at the start through to John and then myself doing all the hand dyeing. Yeah. Um, and we try and work as closely as we can. And I think each, each, each element is as important as the next. Yeah. So buying a skein, you're supporting all of this expertise. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, right yeah. back through to supporting the, you're supporting the countryside, yeah. the, the bird life, the insect life, yeah. to the small business. And, um, and also you're getting something that's really that's nice really as beautiful. well. That's really beautiful, yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here on the farm. We're going to go out soon and have a look at the sheep. And um, it's a beautiful blue sky in, in England. So that's <laughs> an unusual occurrence. <laughs> so thank you so much for spending time on the podcast. It's, oh, it's been a really pleasure. great. Thanks very much. Thank you. So we'll say goodbye. Bye. Bye.